What's your story? Whether you're a client or an independent financial advisor, we know you face many important decisions that can affect your and your clients' long-term financial success. Welcome to the WIN Podcast. What's important now with Corey Hymanson, accredited investment fiduciary and president of Hymanson Wealth Advisors. In this podcast, Corey helps you identify your goals and objectives through financial education and comprehensive planning while inspiring you to make better behavioral decisions in your personal finance. With a twist on pop culture and current events, join us as we explore growth and protection strategies for individuals, advisors, and their businesses. Come and discover what's important to you now. Hello and welcome to the Win Podcast with Corey Hymanson. Corey, how are you? Great. Super to be here. Super to be here with you too. I am excited. We're going to get into some of the chapters in your book today, and uh, I've got it in front of me here. Stop doing dumb things with your money. I love, I still love the title. I think I've told you that like five times. I have to give somebody else credit. It was a friend of mine who told me you had to have a catchy title. So we did a big whiteboard in my basement and it, it, it took multiple days, but we, we came up with something that tried to catch people's attention. <laughs> okay. So, so what were, yeah. What were some of the other names? I'm just going to ask you that right off the bat. They were all textbook worthy. Finance 101. Very, okay. very boring. I, I think this was really the only cool one that jumped out as the light bulb moment of, hey, that's it. That's it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. It is very attention getting. And I mean, if anybody's really honest with themselves, truly honest with themselves, we've all done dumb things with our money <laughs> at times. I had a paper route when I was a kid, man. And I tell you what. One of my favorite things was to, I made way too much money for, for a kid who was, you know, 12 years old or 13 years old at the time. And I didn't do anything good with it. It was like my, my buddies and I would walk to 7-Eleven. I don't know if you had 7-Elevens, you know, growing up where you were at, but 7-Eleven, a little convenience store. And I would get a six pack of raspberry filled powdered donuts and then usually a drink and usually like a comic book or something fun, whatever. And by the time I got home, I had eaten pretty much all the entire pack. It was like a six pack. And uh, boy, to have that metabolism again, Corey, I, <laughs> I would love that. Yeah. You are, you are giving me a flashback to a story. And I haven't thought of this in probably 40 years, but our little town had an arcade and it was just the coolest thing, all these video games. And, and my friend, I'll just disclose his first name, Brett, he had a paper route and that was the day when you would essentially collect, I believe. So he was going around town collecting quarters and had a big bag of quarters and for some reason stops at the arcade, sees us and proceeds to blow the entire bag of money. And I think that was the end of his paper route job because he got home and his parents said, you know, we're not giving you quarters back to pay the, the newspaper company. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You know, he, he used all the quarters that were owed to the company on asteroids or whatever the yep. video game was. But yeah, oh man, that's probably got it. Probably got his initials on the uh, on the bulletin board of the of the arcade game or whatever they did. That's right, and that lasts forever until you unplug it and then <laughs> it resets the whole thing. <laughs> well, uh, let's let's dive into this. You know, and and I want to start by asking you actually why you wrote the book. I don't think we've talked about that on the podcast. Why this? Why uh, did you write it? And why the timing of it? I don't want to sound like one of those old guys that just goes back in time and tells these stories from when I was young, but we, we do need to go backwards on this one a little <laughs> bit. I was probably about 10 years into my career of financial planning, and, and I was starting to get invited to speak at industry conferences and conventions and breakout sessions just to provide some knowledge and possibly coach up other advisors. And I remember, I think I was in uh, San Antonio one time, and, and after my session, a couple of advisors came up to me in the hallway afterwards and said, boy, that was really great content. You should share that with more people. And like the one guy says, maybe you should write a book. And I thought that's the craziest thing ever. I'm, I'm not an author, you know, went about my business. And so a couple of years later, same sort of thing happens again. And it, it was just weird. I kept blowing it off. And then fast forward a couple of years beyond that, one day I was at work, it was a Wednesday and I, I got a phone call from my mother because my father had suffered a stroke and it didn't seem like a big deal. I left work, went to the hospital, not a not an urgent emergency thing that day, but then things kind of turned south the next day. And I'll give you a spoiler alert. He's okay. You know, he's not doing cartwheels and running through the house anymore, but it was a life-changing event for him and my mother, me and everybody. But the real story is he was in the hospital for 90 days. And so every day I would leave work after work and, and drive 45 miles to the hospital. 
and I, and I did this, I think 88 out of the 90 days or something like that. And for some reason, these advisors who had cornered me previously in different years kept popping into my head as I'm driving all this windshield time makes you think too much, I guess. But day after day, I kept thinking about those people saying, you should write a book. And I still thought it was just crazy. And then, I don't know, somewhere along day 65 of driving, I just had an awakening and I thought, why the hell wouldn't I write a book? Why wouldn't I step off the ledge and, you know, do something that's totally out of my character and, and just prove to myself if I can do it? And so I did it. It was crazy. But, you know, it was about a year and a half process of writing it, working through edits and all that good stuff. But I'm really glad I did it now. And, it, and, and I didn't do it to sell 10 million copies or be on the New York Times bestseller list. It was truly to see if I could do it and, hey, put something together that might be beneficial to somebody or, or to lots of people. Yeah. And, and, and I think that I, I like uh, one of the quotes on the back, Jerry Bernard. And one of the things that he said was Corey's book manages to make extremely complicated and stressful situations understandable. And I, and I'll just say that part of the quote, there's more there, but that is what, I know that's the reason you started this podcast. That's you, you want to bring education to the audience. You want to be able to take something that, that the average layperson like myself would find complicated or there's a lot of lingo out there that, that your services or your your uh, the work that you do, the people, other advisors, they use a specific lingo and, and people can get caught up in that. And it's very confusing to the rest of us in, in a lot of ways. And until you have somebody that will take the time and patiently <laughs> sit with you and answer those questions, okay, what does this mean? What, is, what does this specific thing mean? It, it It's kind of intimidating. And so I, I love that quote on the back of the book. And I, I think it's important that we start with one of the chapters in here. I want to I actually talk about chapter two. I'm going to skip chapter one uh, because it's almost, I mean, books can be self-serving in a lot of ways, right? I mean, that, that's people like the notoriety a lot of times. That's not your purpose. That's not why you wrote this. And chapter two really shows you that that's the truth because the, the title is don't buy more financial services than you need. And I think that is one of the largest hurdles that the listening audience or anybody that has concerns about their own finances has to overcome that they have to, you know, they have to get past because a lot of people feel like if I sit down with somebody and it's a lot of people get a bad rap about this, they're going to try to sell me something right off the bat. They're going to try to sell me something and I, I'm not gonna be able to afford it. And then it's going to be embarrassing and it's going to be frustrating. You wrote it right in your book, chapter two, right toward the front. Don't buy more financial services than you need. Why did you write that specific chapter? You really hit it head on. I, I think this is an industry where far too many people are worried about salespeople. And, and, and here, I'm going to go off on a tangent. I mean, if someone in this industry is willing to come to your home, Eric, and meet you at your kitchen table in today's environment, I feel like they do want to sell you something. You, you want to team up with people. I mean, doctors don't make house calls anymore either. I mean, and so this industry has evolved. And I want to try and encourage people that there's still good people in the world that are looking out for others in this industry. And there are a lot of products in this industry that nobody would ever buy unless somebody sold them to them, you know, on a, on a bill of goods. And, and I hate that because there are so many positive things that can go into people's lives from financial services, generation to generation, but man, you got to be teamed up with the right people so that somebody doesn't take advantage of you. You know, and, and I hear it a lot of times from people that say they're insurance poor, you know, and that's, that could be car insurance. That can be long-term care insurance, life insurance, you go on and on and on, but they just feel like they're nickel and dime to death on protecting against all these horrible, horrible things that can happen to them that maybe they aren't focusing on their own creation of wealth, you know, of, of, of investing in things or, or having products that can work for them and be productive in, in building something rather than just protecting against something. Now, I, I don't want to totally throw the insurance industry under the bus, but I mean, there are a lot of things in the world that can be good, but you don't need all of them. No, I agree 100%. And, and it's it's interesting that you brought up the somebody sitting down at your table. Everything has changed, not just COVID, right? That, that I mean, that was just a couple of years ago that that really hit. But even before that, how many of us stopped answering our phone if we didn't see a name attached to that phone number, right? I don't. I, I, I screen my own calls, if you will, because it, most likely it's going to be somebody saying, you know, I've been trying to reach you about your car warranty, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't I don't need that in my life. And, and the same thing with our doorbell, <laughs> though, right? Because a lot of people have ring, right. uh, you know, the, the doorbell with a camera or they have other you know systems out there. If somebody rings my doorbell at, you know, 
5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m., it's weird. It's not like it used to be, oh, somebody's at my house. I'll just go over and it's, it's going to be a friend or it's going to be somebody stopping by. Well, at, at my age now, I've realized most likely it's somebody that has seen a tree in my backyard they think needs to be cut down or they're looking at my windows or my siding and saying, hey, you know, you could update this. I get so many salespeople at the door. It's, it's a little bit frustrating. And I think that that's where you guys get a bad rap and lumped into the, some of those categories. They're there for a purpose. They're there to sell you something. Now I know that you don't go door to door selling services. <laughs> so th- that's not the issue. But when you say more financial services, I know that it's not just insurance. It's not just those things. What are some things that people should be wary of or aware of when it comes to maybe meeting with a financial advisor that, um, they are investigating and they're trying to feel out and, and maybe that financial advisor isn't a fiduciary or they're not playing by the same rules that you do. What should they be looking out? There are a lot of complicated products in the industry and, and some of them are great, but my philosophy really is the old, keep it simple (laughs) type acronym or, or phrase. People should be able to understand the pieces that are part of their plan. And I think that comes from dealing with a fiduciary that, you know, a fiduciary is somebody that by law has to do the right thing. And we don't get paid to put people in products that they can't understand. We, we essentially, or my firm, we like the approach of we're fee-based planners. So we're, we're kind of coaching you up. And if you don't like us anymore, you can show us the door and and we'll go help more people or other people and, and provide value. But it comes down to trust, trust and, and understanding. And if somebody can't explain something to you, you probably don't need it. And so that could be a car warranty. That could be insurance. That could be investments. It could be your banker trying to give you a mortgage. I mean, any of these things, I think people should be able to understand what they own or what they're buying. All right. I'm going to give the audience just a little tip here. We're about halfway through the podcast, but yeah, we're, we're talking about a few different chapters in, in Corey's book today. I want you to know that you can get this book and, and Corey would be more than happy to give it to you for free. Uh, we're going to give contact information at the end, but don't think that this is just something that we're going to chat about and it's going to go away. He's got copies and he's more than happy to give those out. So stay tuned to the end so you can and get that contact information. Get this in your hands because you're going to want to read it. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but we're going to barely scratch the surface of what truly he has in here for content. Uh, so stick around for that. All right, let, let's move on. Um, obviously, you know, you're, you're trying to guard your clients from people that are going to sell them things unnecessarily when you talk about chapter two. Uh, but more importantly, I, I think chapter three, I, I love when you are working with your clients, you're helping them to set goals and you're helping them to um, set goals the right way. And, and as a as a coach in my past, I love that. I love goal setting. Um, it's something that I'm very passionate about because I think that if, if someone doesn't have a goal, th- what path are they on? I mean, it, it, they just meander, right? They, they don't go toward anything specifically. But in chapter three, you specifically titled it, don't set insane goals. So first, what's your in de- definition of an insane goal? Anything that is just off the charts, unrealistic or unachievable. I, I see people and if they don't have a great background of, of how this stuff works, they'll say, I, I want to retire with a million dollars. And I'll, and I'll say to them, great, that's awesome. How are you going to do it? And they'll say, well, I got 24 bucks a month. And I'll tell them they have to retire when they're 214 years old. You know what I mean? Or, or something like that. I mean, y- you look at a guy like Steph Curry basketball player. You see these videos on YouTube and the guy can make in practice 103 pointers in a row from the same spot. I mean, I doubt he woke up one day and said, I'm going to go make 103 pointers in a row today. No, it's a lot of hard work. No matter what your goal is, investing is the same way. It's hard work. You got to be disciplined. You show up, you, you do what's right. And you know what? You have time on your side. This is not a, I don't have a magic bullet, you know, but I can coach people up and show them the path to success. And at times it takes hard work. You know, sometimes you got to save more than you, you really want to, but you'll appreciate it someday. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about a specific situation. I, I'm going to ask you just to, for a client example, no names, of course, or anything, but give me a, give me a, 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 an example of maybe a client that came in with maybe not an insane goal, but a goal that was probably out of reach and how you help them to um, dial that in a little bit, or maybe you had to adjust the time frame of that goal so they could actually hit it. The easiest one is 
people that have a, a 401k or a retirement plan at their work. And, and the first step is to get enrolled. Boy, lots of people just think, I'll start next year. Or I'll start when I'm 30 or 35. Here is the easiest way. Number one, start, do something, some kind of activity. But you get started, and ideally you're doing enough to, to qualify for your employer's matching money. That's in your favor too. And then we try to coach people up to automatically increase their contributions year over year over year whether that's because they got a raise or just because they're tightening the belt or, you know, whatever it is. But if you set some of this stuff on autopilot, I have never, and I mean never, had anybody come back and say, geez, Corey, I wish I wouldn't have done that or I saved too much or you made me start way too early in life. I, I don't like that because <laughs> yeah, at yeah. the end of the day, if, if you got too much, you can give it away to charity. You can pass it on. You can spend it. You can do whatever you want. But boy, I'd rather see people have too much than not enough. And, and, and so you're right, it, it's, just, it's hard for me to, to give out client names and specific numbers and situations, but just starting a plan and sticking to it and, and avoiding the noise of headlines or, or the noise of what your coworkers think or don't think and chart your own path and have a coach that's there to kick you in the tail to remind you why you're doing it once in a while. And, and I'm not saying I'm a drill sergeant, but I mean, I tell it like it is. And, and if somebody needs to hear that they need to save more to meet that goal of that boat or that second house or whatever they're hoping to do or retirement early, you know, sometimes real conversations are, are not super warm and fuzzy. They're uh, somewhat pointed. <laughs> okay. So let me, I'm, I'm going to give you not an example, but I'm going to throw something at you. Let, let's, let's have a scenario here. So I'm 47. Now that now the audience knows how old I am. <laughs> I'm 47 years old. I'm married. My, my kids are no longer in the home. And so I don't have the cost of baseball every year. I don't have the cost of gymnastics or drama or, or any of that stuff. So I have a little more money to my own my own name instead of having to uh, pay for all these other things. Let's say in the 401k, I've got like a hundred grand. Let, let's just let's just throw that number in there. And I want to retire when I'm 65. Uh, that's an, that's an easy number. If I want to retire at 65 and I've got a hundred grand in my 401k, and and we'll just say that my my income is. Mm. let's say my income is 60 grand a year. If I were to come to you and say, I want to have $2 million saved in my accounts, whatever that is, uh, whether that's in my 401k or I've got a, a different account that I'm you know, saving money into, whether it's savings or whatnot, is that realistic for me? Do you think is that, is that something that, you know, if I'm, I'm still carrying a mortgage and I've still got, you know, the, I, I like to go out to eat, I watch a movie every once in a while. Is that a realistic goal or is that something you're going to have to talk to me more about? Dig into that a little bit more. I, I'm not going to give you a, a perfect rainbow answer on that one. L let me, let me give you kind of a yeah, ballpark of projection. And, and I believe it's if a person takes mm -hmm. $6,000 a month, and contributes that or adds that every month for 10 years and you get 6% returns, that'll equal a million bucks. 6,000 a month for 10 years, 6% growth compounded. So, I mean, those are some big numbers, you know, so, so in that scenario, if, if a person's income is 65,000 and I'm asking them to save 6,000 a month, <laughs> they have to get pretty wah, creative wah, or <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. I got to sell platelets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something. I mean, so then we then we reframe the conversation to say you know does it have to be two million or, or can you work longer or is there a windfall or inheritance or you know there's a lot of a lot of things and and we go back to the name of the podcast what's important now i understand you want to retire with that pile of money in 18 years but we have to kind of worry about today whether that means saving today or spending today or what might be coming up and, and just do our best to to fight one battle at a time to get to the bigger goal and who knows? In 12 years, you may decide that you don't want to retire at, at 65. You know, I don't know. So that was, a, that was a really long way to say, yeah, you're out of luck. You're not going to have enough money <laughs> to meet the $2 million goal. But then we revamp the plan and we come up with a way to, to, to do what's, what's next or, or what can work. And, and I think that that's, again, a part of that conversation is if your goal is 2 million, why, why, why is your goal 2 million? Well, I, I just think that's a great number. Well, fantastic. But that doesn't really give me a lot to work with. What are you looking for in retirement? How much income do you need or want in retirement? I mean, all those things are what you do. And I, and I appreciate that about you. I know I knew that I just threw those numbers completely randomly at you, but it, it's, I think there's a big misconception out there that if I have a million dollars in an account, 
when I retire, I'm good. And that that's all I'm going to need. But I'll tell you what, I I've seen my, my father's 82. He's, he actually retired at 55. So he's going on 30 years in retirement alone. Uh, and he's still going strong. So it, that if he if he had had a million dollars, he had other retirement, Air Force and 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 uh, you know Boeing and all that. So it wasn't it wasn't something where he had just one lump sum that he's living off of all these years. But a lot of people don't have multiple you know checks coming in like he does, and of course he's got Social Security now as well. So he's got three checks coming in every month. But I, I think there's that misconception that a million dollars is going to get me through retirement. And it all depends on the lifestyle you want to live. And and I know that's part of the conversation that you have with every client. Yeah, you nailed that, Eric. I mean, I use this line all the time. It is not how big your pile of money is. It is absolutely cash flow, whether that's checks coming in, like you mentioned, or if it's just drawn off your pile of investments, that, that success is being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And that takes cash flow or or money in the bank. And you're right. Far too many people think that they retire because of an X on a calendar, like, hey, my birthday's such a day and I turn 65, I'm done. That decision should really be in your heart of when you want to quit working and what's important to you, if that's family or travel or volunteering your time or whatever it is. But you're right. Every, everybody's plan is everybody's plan and every snowflake's different or whatever you want to say. Well, and, and we spoke about it in, in, I think, the second or third podcast that you did, that it's, it's really about constant communication. You like to have that constant communication with your clients and, and you want them to communicate to you because, like you said, I, I mean, I gave you a scenario where I want to retire in 18 years. 18 years is a long time. I can't remember 18 years ago, right? Because technically 18 years ago, what I was, I was 29, right? Roughly that I don't remember being 29 dude. Anyway. So right. 18 years, things can change. And, and I think we've joked about this off air, maybe on air, but in the last few years, my life has changed. I have grandkids now and, and where my wife and I had this goal, a pathway. Um, when we had our first grandchild, my wife lost her mind, right? She's, she is, she is <laughs> Nana, right? She's Nana and, and she loves that title. I love Papa, of course, but, but she's gone bananas. And so that is definitely a change that has happened in our life that changed our, you know, retirement quote unquote outlook and what we want to do and how we want to, you know, supply now for our grandchildren's maybe education. And, and we have so much more to think about. And I know that that's, again, you have those conversations with your clients, um, I'm I'm excited. I don't want to just cut this off, but tell us a little bit about that next podcast because you're going to cover something that I think the audience is really going to enjoy. Yeah, the next podcast is episode number five. And so I'm going to bring five highlights from the week before the podcast, if that makes any sense. So I'm going to basically bring five highlights from a financial advisor's world of things that happen in any given day that are things you would probably never expect a financial advisor to do. I'm looking forward to that. Any closing thoughts for today's podcast on, on the things that we've talked about already? Your last comments really nailed it because I, I took a secure business text just before I walked in this room. It, it was a client last week who was telling me to invest a bunch of money from their bank. And they texted me this morning and said they put an offer in on a condo. So within, within six days, <laughs> we have totally scrapped the plan that we you know, put together over the course of a month because life changes, you know, something came up and they think they got a good deal and heck, I'm excited for them. I'm not about hoarding the money here. I want to see them do good things. Now, let me ask you, maybe you can say it, maybe you can't. Is that a investment property for them or is that going to be like a second home for them? That is an improvement to their existing residence. Just something that's a little easier to live in and uh, less steps and kind of the next uh, evolution of the life journey, I guess you'd say. Absolutely. That's... <laughs> I can't believe you just said that because that's exactly what my wife and I are looking forward to. We have a we have a plan again, always about the plan and goals. And the plan is within three years to be on a property that we want to be on with a house that has less stairs. Perfect. <laughs> I'm tired. Of, I'm tired of climbing all these stairs, man. Hey, there you go. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You can do that. Get rid of the stairs, and then you'll buy like a stairmaster to get your exercise. No, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really interested. I'm, I'm super interested in like Peloton and, and the bikes and things. And I really want the technology to get to the point where I can have true virtual reality on my head. 
I can be on a bike and I can be riding my bicycle anywhere I want to in the world. <laughs> That's what I'm, I'm waiting for. It's, it's, it's just around the corner. I mean, they've already got things that are similar, but I want that full VR so I can look to the left and look to the right and I can be riding my bike through Italy. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be amazing. I'd like to see you run the Tour right. de France. Heck. I'm not running. We're not <laughs> well, doing stairs. I mean, we're not running, Corey. I'm running. Okay. Bicycle. I said a bicycle. Participate in the Tour de France. There you <laughs> that's, go. That's right. Oh, can I be one of those motorcycle riders that, <laughs> that uh, you know, rides in front or behind it? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Oh, Totally do that. We are off the rails, my friend. <laughs> off the rails. Absolutely. Absolutely. And okay, so before we end this podcast, before we get completely off the rails, the book. You're going to offer this up to everybody. How do they get the book? Absolutely. Give us a call. Office number here, toll free, 800 657 Four three one six. We will ship it to you, or you can pick it up here. We are, we want you to have it in your hands and to get some value out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna just gonna throw the challenge out there. We we don't want anybody to take the book that's not actually gonna read it, and that sounds kind of harsh. And I'm not saying that this is a requirement by any means, but if you do get a book, I I would love for you to actually add to this podcast. And the way you can do that is I want you to email your favorite chapter. And why? So give Corey some feedback. Give him some feedback about what your favorite chapter was and what what you got out of it. Or the flip side of that coin, I know Corey's open to this as well. If there's something that should have been in the book that you think is missing from the book or something that you want to learn about, email in and, and tell him that too. Corey, what email should they use for that? That would be podcast at the win dot today. Really? That is fantastic. Dude, what, what, podcast at the win T H E W I N dot today. The win dot, dot today. today. Yep. Man, that's a fantastic email. I've never heard that one before. I'm super excited I ask you now. All right. Well, Corey, thank you so much for your time today. And of course, we want to thank you, the listening audience. We wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Win Podcast with Corey Hymanson. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Corey comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And again, I'm, I'm going to humbly ask that you do share this podcast with your friends and family. Number one, it spreads the word. It gets more people educated and it can really create some interesting conversations between all of you guys. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Hymanson Wealth Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Win Podcast. What's important now? The show that helps you achieve your financial dreams. To ask questions about topics covered during the show or get a copy of Stop Doing Dumb Things With Your Money by Corey Hymanson, visit www.hymansonwealth.com or give us a call at 712-472-3867. Don't forget to click the follow button below to be notified when new episodes become available. Securities offered through Securities America, Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Advisory services offered through Securities America Advisors, Inc. Hymanson Wealth Advisors and Securities America are separate entities.